Hello, and welcome to the 2021 Ole Miss Choral Symposium. I'm Don Trott, Director of Choral Activities here at the University of Mississippi. I am thrilled to be here with you as we begin our five-part series presented this week titled Performing Renaissance Music, a Virtual Symposium on Historical Performance with our presenter, Dr. Dennis Schrock. This week's production is the combined efforts of many people, and we are grateful for all of their wonderful work. I hope you've already had the opportunity to view our introductory video that was released in April. What follows this evening is part one titled Sources and Forces. On behalf of the University of Mississippi, I welcome you, and now it is my opportunity to welcome Dennis Schrock. Thank you, Dr. Trott. And for my part, welcome to the first of five videos, each discussing specific aspects of performance. The first, sources and forces. The second, sound and pitch. Then meter and tempo, for phrasing and text underlay. And finally, ornamentation and expression. I apologize for reading from a script, but it is quite necessary for the technician who coordinates what I say with imagery and musical examples, many of them. And once the script has been written, I find it difficult to be spontaneous. Each video explores performance practices that existed or were idealized during the Renaissance era as related by primary sources. Primary sources being documents from the period of the Renaissance era, the period in which the music was composed and first performed. The documents tell us what to do and what not to do or what is important in performance and what is not. For sources, we turn to the most fundamental of the primary documents, the actual music. We see what it looked like and we learn what the notation means, how to interpret the notational symbols and how they are like or unlike notation in modern day editions. First, and a common thread in all the videos, and the aspect of performance I'll explore in the final video, is expression. Specifically, the relationship of music to the other arts, the paintings, sculptures, architecture, clothing, and printed imagery. All these other arts created during the years of the Renaissance era. From this my premise is that the music and performance should reflect the rich colors and expressive exuberance of, for example, the following artworks, some famous and some decidedly not. First, the Piccolomini Library in Siena, built in 1492 to house the collection of books and manuscripts owned by Pope Pius II and decorated between 1503 and 1508, with vibrant and richly colored frescoes that, as you can see, cover every inch of the ceiling and walls. Second, the Botticelli Madonna of the Magnificat, called so because Mary is writing the text of the Magnificat, Magnificat anima mea dominum et exultavi spiritus meus in Deo salutari meo. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. The painting, also called Virgin and Child with Five Angels, was done in 1481 and is now dis displayed in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. I'm showing it here, not only for the rich colors of the garments on Mary and the angels, but also for the rich design of the frame. Third up, and you'll find fascinating, is Summer, painted by Giuseppe Arcimboldo, one of four paintings called The Four Seasons, each painting depicting a face composed of fruits and vegetables common to one of the seasons. In Summer, now housed in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, you can see the face of a woman with an apple for her cheek, a pear for her chin, cherries for her lips, a cucumber for her nose, plus corn, garlic, grapes, and berries in her headdress. 
and notice the intricate weaving of her dress with the date 1563 woven on her shoulder. And now for sculptures. Michelangelo's Pieta, perhaps the most famous painting of the Renaissance era, carved between 1498 and 1499 when Michelangelo was 23 and considered so expressively beautiful, it was placed in St. Peter's at the Vatican, where it continues to reside, and where, by the way, Josquin de Pre would have seen it since he was in the Vatican choir at the time. For our purposes here, take note of the folds of cloth on Mary's head and on her dress. And quite different, a salt cellar by Venuto Cellini, carved in 1543, to be actually used and put on a dinner table. It is only 10 by 13 inches and made of ivory, gold, and porcelain, with figures representing sea and land. Neptune, the sea, beside a vessel for salt, and Tellus, the mother of earth, beside a temple for pepper. And now architecture. Here is the dome of the Florence Cathedral the largest dome in the world, designed by Filippo Brunelleschi and constructed between 1420 and 1436. It and the completed cathedral was dedicated formally on March 25, 1436 by Pope Eugenius IV with the premier performance of Guillaume du Fay's motet Nupe Rosarum Flores. And here, for fascination, is the Gubbio Studiola. Studiola being a small room for study and contemplation. This room was designed by Francesco di Giorgio Martini in 1478 for Duke Federico da Montefelto and his palace in the small town of Gubbio. The, studio, the Studiola, similar to others at the time, contains depictions of books, scientific and musical instruments, and other symbols of knowledge. Unique to this room, however, the depictions were done with inlaid wood as a trompe d'oeil, or trick of the eye, to appear three-dimensional when they are not. All the surfaces are flat. There is no real open door on the lower right of the photo here, or a real counter with a spinet keyboard in the center of the photo. Meanwhile, the room, which you can actually enter and look around, as I've done many times, is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And we turn to imagery. Here is an Albrecht Dürer knot. This is one of six woodcuts done in 1507 of elaborate lace-like knots fashioned after drawings found in the studio of Leonardo da Vinci. Note here not only the intricate geometric designs, made all the more impressive because they were carved by a knife in a piece of wood, but also note Durer's iconic autograph, AD, in the center of the knot. And finally, the Mira Monumenta. This is a page from the Mira Calligraphe Monumenta, which translates as model book of calligraphy, Mira being the word for model. It was created between 1591 and 1596 for the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand I and later decorated by, for Leopold II. The book is comprised of 129 pages of highly decorative scripts of various sorts and illuminations of flowers, fruits, and insects. This, page nine, with a beetle and wasp and cherries. The Monumenta is now at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, and facsimile reproductions are for sale. I have a copy and display it proudly, changing the pages regularly for my amazement and enjoyment. I apologize again, this time for the long introduction, 
I hate it when I hear a lecture and the presenter goes off on a long introduction that seems to have little to do with the subject. However, I promise you that all the artworks we've seen apply directly to the music. And with the music, we begin with the frontispieces or covers of musical manuscripts or printings. First, here, is the Cantus, or soprano, frontispiece of Philippe Verdelot's Book of Madrigals for Five Voices, published by Antonio Gardane in Venice in 1541. All books of music, such as this, had covers that were richly decorated, often with images of Greek gods and goddesses, or of animals, as here, representing various aspects of cultural importance. Next up is the front of Palestrina's Misarum Liber Primus, his first book of masses. Depicted is Palestrina himself, presenting the book of masses to Pope Julius III, who had, in 1551, appointed Palestrina Maestro di Capella of the Capella Giulia, the Vatican choir of St. Peter's. This choir was established some 40 years earlier by Pope Julia II, thus the name of the choir as the Capella Julia, distinguished from the Capella Sistina, or the Sistine Chapel Choir, the Pope's choir that sang for him in the Sistine Chapel. But what is important here is, of course, the rich and very detailed imagery. Third up is the Ecomium Musices, or Ecology of Music, a volume of 18 engravings depic depicting biblical verses that have musical subjects, published by Philippe Gallet in Antwerp in, in about 1590. This title page shows a six-voice motet in praise of music by the Flemish composer Andreas Pevernage. The manuscript of the music shows parts on the left page for Superius I, Tenor, and Basus I, and on the right page for Superius II, Contratenor, and Basus. Surrounding manuscript are statues of Harmonia on the left and Minerva on the right, and a rather incredible array of musical instruments all around. Fourth, here is John Dowland's first book of lute songs, or as stated in the center of the cover, the first book of songs or airs of four parts with tablature for the lute. Published in 1613, I'm showing it here obviously for the rich display of cultural disciplines that surround the book's title. Geometria and Arithmetica on the lower left, and Astronomia and Musica on the lower right. The music itself is also decorated. For example, when we open the books, we see the music always presented with an illuminated first letter of text, as in the Cantus part of Orlando di Lasso's Motet in Praise of mu Music, Musica Dei Donum Optimi, or all four parts of Antoine Brumel's Kyrie in the Misa de Beata Vergine. Note that both the Kyrie and Christe sections have illuminated first letters. Or all four parts of Josquin de Pre's Kyrie in his Misa in his Misa de Beata Vergine. And finally, the Cantus part of Palestrina's Kyrie from his famous Misa Pape Marcelli. Note the less elaborate illuminations of the Christe and Second Kyrie. But many of the illuminations are not just paintings, but are works of art with rich colors. For instance, Josquin's four parts of the Kyrie from his Misa Pange Lingua contained in the Oco Codex, which is a choir book of about 1515, for the Habsburg Burgundian court in the Netherlands, made for the banker Pompeius Occo. Note that the illuminated letters are not for the word Kyrie, 
but for the voice parts. S for superius on the upper left, T for tenor on the lower left, C for contra on the upper right, and B for basus on the lower right. Next we see the Requiem, or Misa pro Fidelibus Defunctoris, by Antoine de Favin, with the inscription Antonius Divitis Pie Memoriae on the top of the right-hand page. This manuscript, also from the Oco Codex, has letter illumination similar to those in the Jascan Misa Pantia Lingua we've just seen, here with the name of the tenor and altus parts contained within the illuminated first letter. And here is the famous Chansonnier de Jean de Montchagny, put together in 1470 in Savoy, France. It is a cordiform, which means it is a manuscript in the shape of a heart. This cordiform, containing 44 polyphonic chansons by Dufailly, Ockeghem, Bunois, among others. And here is the famous Baudet Cordier Rondeau, Belle Bonne Sage, from the Chantilly Codex. This very early Renaissance chanson was composed as a heart-shaped cordiform, with the heart shape being a re representation of the chanson's text, which begins, Belle Bonne Sage, plaisante et gentille, lovely, good, wise, gentle, and noble one, and goes on, I make you a gift of a new song within my heart. All the music, from the covers of collections to the illuminations of text, is represented by design that is every bit as rich and expressive as the paintings, sculptures, clothing, and imagery. So with this in our mind's eye, we turn now to the musical notation we see in original sources, and in doing so, we first encounter clefs, meter signatures, and pitch levels. Returning to the Jascan Kyrie from the Oko Codex, we see the cantus clef and part on the top left, the tenor clef and part on the lower left, the contra or alto clef on the upper right, and the basus clef on the lower right. So we know that the Kyrie was composed for soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. Then we see an empty circle mensuration sign after the clefs in all four voice parts. And when we look at a chart of the four mensuration signs or meter signatures used at the time during the Renaissance, we see that the empty circle is tempus perfectum prolatio minor which translates as 3-2 or 3-4, three, 3 beats per measure, 2 beats divided. For the part itself, the tenor begins the mass with three whole notes, followed by a double whole note and several half notes, but we don't perform from editions that so show such large note values. Be very difficult for us to read. So we see it additions with reduced note values, we see three half notes followed by a whole note and several quarter notes. Similarly, we don't see today the bird motet Ave Verum Corpus with an original double whole note, then whole notes and half notes. We see instead the note values reduced by half, and we also see both in the original manuscript and in modern day editions the half circle or C mensuration sign, which we assume to mean common time or four beats per measure. Such is the case in this edition of the motet that shows the original C and its transference to 4-4 four four in what we refer to as prefatory bars. That is, a sampling of the original notation, the voice part names, clefs, note values, and pitch levels are shown as a preface to the modernization of the notation. Terrific! But the meaning of C as common time, or 4-4, four, four, is a gross misunderstanding. As we look again at the mensuration sign chart, 
we see at the bottom of the chart that the empty half circle, or C, refers to tempus imperfectum prolatio minor, which means two beats per measure, with a half note getting the beat. There was no 4-4 four -four or common time during the Renaissance, and there is virtually no instance when the quarter note in present-day editions is the pulse or tactus of the music. Prefatory bars are wonderful, and we should seek out modern-day editions that show them, but we must understand the meanings of the notations first. And here I must state a major problem between our understanding and treatment of music from the Renaissance era and our understanding and treatment of the other arts, the visual arts. All of the visual artworks, samples of which I have shown you, are colorful and overtly expressive. We see the rich colors, but the Renaissance music we hear today, composed at exactly the same time as the painting, sculptures, and imagery, is different. We don't hear the richness of the music. We hear performances that are flat, dull, and restrained. It is as if the music has been covered up by centuries of dust and grime that conceal its vibrant colors. More precisely, centuries of misunderstandings about notation and performance have obscured the beauty of the music and stripped it of its richness. When the visual arts, by contrast, are concealed by dust and grime, they are restored. Millions of dollars are spent in the restoration process and new tech technologies are learned about and used to help in the process. Just think of the money and dedication to techniques that restore paintings, sculptures, and architecture. And just as well, think if there were dedicated efforts to understand the notation of the music. If the people who perform the music would be committed in education and resources to restoration, the music would, without a doubt, resemble in aural quality the expressiveness of the visual experience. By learning about the notational meanings and performance practices, we clean off the dirt and grime of past misunderstandings, and we restore the music to its natural beauty. And as a result, we can better appreciate the music and create a desire to perform more of it with greater frequency. But back to specifics about the notation of the music, I'll talk much more about meter signatures in the fourth video, devoted obviously to meter and tempo, and about clefs in the third video, devoted to sound and pitch. The point here about original manuscripts and prefatory bars is that they give us information about the original intent of the music. So, if we see the half circle C in a prefatory bar, we can interpret it as cut time or a la breve, as seen in this edition of the anthem, Rejoice in the Lord Alway. Meanwhile, most composers on mainland Europe used the then more modern C with a slash through it, the actual a la breve meter signature. You can see it easily in manuscripts we've already looked at. The Lasso Motet Musica Dei Donum Optimi the Brumel Kyrie from the Misa de Beata Vergine, the Josquin Kyrie from his Misa de Beata Vergine, and the Palestrina Kyrie from the Misa Pape Marcelli. Understanding original clefs is also important because they tell you for whom the part was composed. And this brings us to the second section of this video, the forces we use in performance the singers, and instruments. To begin, we may encounter a piece which on the surface seems to have the top two voices scored for soprano and alto, but may actually be scored for two soprano parts. And these may not be a higher first soprano part and a somewhat lower second soprano part, but instead two parts with the same range. This is the case with the anthem, O Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem, by Thomas Tompkins, which, as you can see, 
has both top parts scored with soprano clef, but the top part scored and indicated for medius cantoris, and the second part scored and indicated for medius decani. These terms refer first to a medium range soprano part, and second to the arrangement of the choral parts in an English cathedral setting. One half of the choir sat on the cantorus or cantor side of the cathedral, the north or left side, while the other half of the choir sat on the decani or dean side of the cathedral, the south or right side. Some Renaissance English anthems alternate the cantorus and decani choral parts, and you'll see the abbreviation C-A-N period and D-E-C period in the scores. O Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem just divides the two treble parts throughout the anthem. You can also see a part for organ, pars organica, and this was common in English Renaissance anthems, the organ part being a basic reduction of the choral parts, not a different and individual part as would occur later in the Baroque era. To better comprehend and highlight the two soprano parts, and to take advantage of the flexible scoring that I'll discuss in several moments, we present the anthem here with only the two soprano parts sung and with an organ accompaniment. Two soprano parts in the same range was also common, very common, when a piece had scoring for SSA, two sopranos and an alto. Such is the case with the madrigal Flora Gave Me Fairest Flowers by Thomas Wilby. Here, we'll perform it with two sopranos accompanied by lute. <laughs> Thank you. 
Such manner of performing only some of the voice parts of a composition with instrumental accompaniment was quite common. And I quite like hearing both the Tompkins anthem and the Wilby Madrigal sung this way. It's delightful to focus on and hear the interplay of the two soprano parts. And doing so, performing music with just some of the vocal parts opens up a huge range of possibilities for us and for our ensembles. We can isolate scoring in this and other manners because we know from primary sources that music during the Renaissance era was often made accessible to varying groups of performance by equally various modes of singing and playing according to what might have been available. The practice was referred to as si placet, as you please, and many title pages of scores acknowledge variety of forces. Such is the case with John Dowland's first book of songs or airs <clears throat> that states, as you can read here, the music is so made that all the parts together or either of them separately may be sung to the lute or ferion or viola da gamba. Following this advice, we'll take one of the songs or airs in the publication, What If I Never Speed, and we'll present it with soprano, singing measures one to eight alone with lute, alto joining her on the repeat of measures one to eight with the second line of text, the soprano singing measures nine to the end of the piece alone again with lute, and a quartet of SATB voices singing the repeat again with lute. We can also take a piece such as Hans Leo Hostler's ballad Tanzen und Springen, which is scored for SSATB voices, and we can perform it with the top three voices if we might have only treble voices on hand, or with the bottom three voices if we have low voices available. Since the ballad has two verses, as was common, we've opted to present it to you in two manners the top three voices singing the first verse and the bottom three voices singing the second verse. We've also joined everyone together for a recap of the music's final phrase. Tanzen und Schrien, singen und klingen, voll la la la, voll la la la, voll la. Tanzen und Schrien, singen und klingen, Schöne Jungfrauen 
in grünen Auen. Falla la la, falla la la la, falla. Mit ihm spazieren und konversieren, freudlich zu schätzen, freut mich im Herzen für Silber und Gold. Falla la la, falla la la, falla. We can also take a part that has no text and that might have been meant for an instrument of some sort and have that part sung. We've done this with Guillaume Dufay's chanson, La Bella C'est Cie. The text for the two upper parts is, in English translation, The fair maiden sat at the base of the tower where she wept and sighed in great sorrow. Her father asked, Daughter, what is wrong? Do you want a husband or do you want a lord? I don't want a husband. I don't want a lord. I want my lover who rots in the tower. My God, my fair daughter, you cannot have him because he will be hanged tomorrow at dawn. Father, if he is hanged, whisk me beneath. Thus people will say, these were loyal lovers. I've given the untexted part shown in italics, the repeated words from the text Great sorrow, she wept and sighed with great sorrow. Here is the score and realization sung by three voices. <laughs> And as yet another version of C. Placet performance, here is a rendering of Orlando di Lasso's four-part madrigal, 
Canzone La Doglia e il Pianto e Ben, performed by the Gruppa für Alte Musik, conducted by Martin Zöbeli. The madrigal, which has all four parts originally texted, is performed by a vocal bass and viola da gamba is playing the other parts. Interestingly, the entire CD of Lasso Madrigals from 1587 contains all sorts of si placet renditions. In the meantime, there are yet two other aspects of original notation that need to be discussed in reference to the sources of music, sharp and flat signs and bar lines. Composers wrote few sharps and flats in the music, sharps and flats that were not part of a key signature, because there was a general understanding that some pitches would be sung higher or lower than notated for reasons of melodic or harmonic function called causa munaris, or for reasons of beauty called causa pulchritudinis. Pitches were not raised or lowered simply because they happened to be in ascending or descending melodic passages, nor were pitches altered to avoid harmonic dissonances or textural tritones. Pitches were raised, called musica ficta, or lowered, called musica recta, to better effectuate their functional role or their perceived beauty within the melodic and harmonic texture of a composition, most especially and almost entirely at cadences. I quote primary sources that talk about the role and uses of musica ficta and musica recta, and I show quite a few musical examples in the book Performing Renaissance Music. But for now, I'll show you its importance in one piece of music, the chanson Con Marie by Orlando di Lasso. Here you can see the alto part, the contratenor, that Lasso notated an E flat on the two penultimate notes of the piece. And here you can see in the tenor part an E-flat in the middle of the first line, and another E-flat in a repeat of the same phrase of music about a fifth of the way into the second line. Lasso marked no other accidentals in the chanson other than these three E-flats. But this 
instead is what we see today in virtually every edition of the music. We see a C sharp in the soprano part of measure two, a comparable C sharp in the tenor part of measure three, an F sharp appearing as if it has manuscript authority, which it doesn't, in the alto of measure five, and only a recta E flat suggestion in the tenor part of measures five and seven when the flat was actually printed in the original manuscript. And this is how the first seven measures sound this way, sung slowly now for better comprehension. The F sharps should be Fichte recommendations since they are the leading tones in the key of the music, not the C sharps because the chanson does not cadence in D, but instead in G. Moreover, since Lasso marked E flats in the alto and tenor parts, and since it was common for the sixth degree of the scale to be lowered to highlight the function of a succeeding fifth degree, one might put recta E flats in the alto part of measure two, as you can see here, and the corresponding tenor part of measure three. This is how it sounds. Now, here's how the entire chanson sounds, with tempo variations that I'll explain in video three that address tempo. The other notational anomaly concerns bar lines, which we assume did not exist, but which occasionally did. For example, in the pavane Bella qui tient ma via, contained in the dance book Orchisography by Toineau Arbeau, first published in 1588. You can see here the parts for a drum and superius, contratenor, alto, tenor, and bassus all with regularly spaced bar lines. Let's look at a transcription of the score and listen to a performance. We are performing three of the Pavan seven verses and following the practice of flexible performance, si placet, we'll do the first verse with soprano and lute, the second verse with soprano, tenor and lute, and the third verse with all four voice parts and lute.
summary, I hope you'll become interested in looking at original manuscripts and printings. So many of them are on the website IMSLP. Otherwise, I hope you'll remember that C means two beats per measure. To look at clefs carefully to determine voice parts and to take advantage of the C placet practice, performing music as befits your particular circumstances. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Schrock. And we look forward to tomorrow evening when we present part two, sound and pitch. Thank you for watching.